Okay, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing this nice uh, workshop. And it has been going very well for the last one month, and it will go also very well for the rest of the part. So today I'll talk about uh, extreme uh, statistics in 1D Coulomb gas. I'll explain what is 1D Coulomb gas. So this is a, a work done uh, in collaboration with uh, Abhishek Dhar uh, from ICTS, Sanjeev Shahabandit from uh, Raman Research Institute, and uh, Shatta Majumdar and Gregory uh, from LPTMS Orse. So uh, Abhishek, Shatya and Sanjeev, all of uh, them are here, and Gregory will join us in, in a week or probably in two weeks. Okay, so uh, universality. So this is a common concept uh, in uh, statistical physics, and we come across this concept in uh, basic courses of statistical physics. For example, in phase transition, in liquid gas phase transition, or paramagnetic to ferromagnetic phase transition. But there is another uh, simpler and widely known concept where one observes this universality is the central limit theorem. So how do you consider um, in independent and identically distributed uh, random variables chosen from some uh, parent distribution Px with uh, finite moments, then if you consider the sum of these variables, then in the large n limit, if you scale that variable, uh, sorry, shift that variable by its mean and scale it by its fluctuation, then that scale variable uh, converge, the distribution of the scale variable converges to a uniform, uh, sorry, universal function the universal distribution, which is Gaussian, irrespective of the forms of the um, parent uh, distribution. So this is one uh, notion of universality. So there is another uh, but less widely known uh, scenario is the extreme value statistics, where you consider one second in uh, independent and identically distributed random variables chosen from some parent distribution, Px. And this time you uh, look at the maximum of these variables. And you look at the cumulative probability that the maximum is less than some value x. And once again, if you look at in the large L limit, then this uh, uh, cumulative probability in the large L limit, uh, after proper shifting and scaling, converges to an universal function. And that there, are, there exist only three types of universal functions, depending on the uh, behavior of this parent distribution at its tails. And these are known. And these functions, these three types of functions are Gumbel, Frisch, and Weibull. Now, if these variables, so remember that these variables are independent and identically distributed. But if they are not independent, they are strongly correlated random variables, then what happens to, what will be the answer to this question? So uh, given the joint distribution of these n variables, what will be the distribution of the maximum of these variables? So this question, um, uh, and since uh, uh, for the last of two decades, this question has been studied in the context of random matrix theory. Although the development of this theory in the random matrices uh, did not uh, uh, develop starting from this question. But OK, so let me tell you this, uh, the answer to this question. So usually what one considers, one considers an n cross n Gaussian random matrices, where the elements are random and chosen from some Gaussian distribution from this kind of distribution, which is such that, that it is invariant under uh, various rotations, for example, in orthogonal rotations or unitary rotations of, or symplectic uh, transformations. And since the elements are random, then if you diagonalize this uh, 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 matrix, then the eigenvalues will also be random, and uh, they will have some correlations also. And the question is, what is the distribution of the maximum of those eigenvalues? So uh, here I should mention that whatever results I will tell here, will, uh, Satya will give a lecture tomorrow, and he will tell about these results in detail. OK, so, uh, so to understand the statistics of the maximum eigenvalues, so one should look at the spectral statistics, which is the joint distribution of the eigenvalues. And that joint distribution was computed in, uh, by Wigner in 1951. So here I uh, write down the joint distribution in the uh, uh, different form, where I consider the scaled eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues are typically of order n. If you have n cross n uh, matrix, the eigenvalues are typically of order root n. And these lambdas are scaled by root n. Okay. So this is an elegant form uh, of joint distributions, where beta is uh, some parameter which takes values 1, 2, and 4, depending on the symmetries of the matrices, which is called the Dyson matrix. And given this joint distribution, what is the distribution of lambda max? OK, so at this point, we note that this distribution can also be thought of as a um, Boltzmann weight of a gas of in pairwise repelling charges, which are uh, repelling via this 2D Coulombic uh, interaction, which is logarithmic interactions, and they're confined in an external uh, harmonic potential, although they are confined to move in one dimension. 
uh, uh, although they are interacting via 2D Coulomb interaction, they are moving, they are living in one dimension. So you can think of that as a Boltzmann weight of these particles, which are interacting via this and confined by this uh, external harmonic potential. And in this language, the maximum eigenvalue corresponds to the position of the rightmost particle uh, in this gas. So um, uh, we are interested in the uh, statistics of the uh, um, position of the rightmost particle. So in order to do, uh, look at that, let us first look at what will be the what will the charges on an average will do, or typically they will do. So in the larger limit, it turns out that because of this competition, this term tries to pull them near zero. Whereas this term tries to push them apart. As a result, they will settle down on a typically in the large limit or a finite region. And the density over this finite region is uh, described by this semicircular law, which is now known as the Wigner's semicircle. And because of that, see, they uh, settle down over a finite region. So we can easily see that on an average, the rightmost particle will appear. So the average value of uh, the lambda max will be root 2. So we know the average value is root 2. Now, this uh, lambda max will fluctuate around this value. And it turns out that the typical fluctuations of this um, uh, value um, of lambda max around this value is of order n power minus 2 third. So uh, uh, probably I, I, uh, will tell about uh, in detail how to uh, get idea about these uh, fluctuations. I'll also give uh, some uh, uh, idea in a different problem. OK, so the question is, what is the distribution about these typical fluctuations? So this uh, distribution was computed by these two mathematicians, Harold Widom and Craig Tessie in 1994. And they showed that this, uh, if you uh, shift this um, uh, lambda max variable by its mean, and then scale it by its fluctuation, this is the order of fluctuation, uh, the typical fluctuations. If you scale it, then this random variable has uh, a limiting uh, distribution uh, in the n going to infinite limit, which is now known as the Tessie-Widom distribution. And it is given by the solution expressed in terms of the uh, uh, hastings macleod solution of Pahlavi 2 equation uh, for different beta. For example, here I write the uh, solutions for beta equal to 2, where Q satisfies the Pahlavi 2 equation, the boundary condition that the QY, which I forgot to write, QY goes to any function in the Y going to infinite, positive plus infinity uh, limit. OK, so uh, this is the uh, limiting distribution. And these are the plots for the limiting distribution, which I took it from Wikipedia um, uh, for beta equal to 1, beta 2, and beta 4. And these, uh, these distributions uh, are highly asymmetric in the sense that the decay on the uh, large negative values of x and the large limiting, uh, positive values of s are uh, not same. So in large negative values of z, this function decays as e to the power minus beta over 24 mod z cube, whereas on the large uh, positive values, it decays as e to the power minus uh, z power 3 by 2. So this is highly uh, asymmetric. However, this distribution describes the distribution of the typical fluctuations around this mean value. And the typical fluctuations occur in length scale n power minus 2 third. But they do not uh, describe the large uh, uh, deviations, like the uh, large fluctuations of order 1. So fluctuations here from this point. And those are described by appropriate large deviation functions. And these large deviation forms, Satya uh, Majumdar, uh, David Dean, and Massimo Bhargasala and uh, collaborators, they have computed in several papers these large deviation forms and these large deviation functions explicitly. And they showed that on the left side, uh, the large deviation form is different from the right side. Here, you note that it is e to the power minus n squared times the large deviation function, rate function, whereas on the right side, the probability decays as e to the power minus n times a uh, rate function. And these rate functions, they have computed explicitly. Uh, the interesting, uh, the important point to note that these functions, the left function goes to 0 as you approach uh, from below to root 2 as root 2 minus w uh, power cube. Whereas the right, fun right reservation function goes to 0 as you approach from above as w minus root 2 power 3, 3 by 2. So this is uh, one important point that this is cubic and this is 3 by 2. And another thing is, uh, important point to note is that 
Here, in the large division form, the speed in the exponent, exponent is n square, whereas here the speed is n. So as a result, if you look at this uh, 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 quantity, which is analogous to a free energy, which is, uh, if you take 1 over n square of log of the cumulative probability, then in the large n limit, this quantity converges to this n independent form, which is which varies on the left side but remains zero on the right side. As a result, uh, this is analogous to a free energy which has discontinuous third order derivative, which suggests of three third order phase transition in the usual sense as in the thermodynamics. Okay, so so this is a, a kind of a, a quick uh, summary of the extreme value statistics of log gas or the the uh, gas. Uh, constructed from the distribution of the eigenvalues of random matrices uh, and it has three different phases one is central phase central region and then there are two large division regimes so this is uh, this uh, uh, third order phase transition have also been observed in various other uh, systems but this decidum distribution which uh, uh, describes the typical fluctuation is uh, have been found to be uh, ubiquitous because it, it appears in various uh, seemingly unrelated problems. For example, it appears in the Ulam problem of longest increasing subsequence. Then in the height fluctuations of, of uh, Carter Paris is Yang equation in one plus one dimension. Then uh, there are, many, are the various other problems. For example, it appears in the maximum displacement of uh, in non-intersecting Brownian bridges. It also has have been observed in uh, experiments, in uh, liquid crystal experiments and also in coupled uh, laser experiments. And there are two uh, very nice science articles. One is in Nature Physics and another one is in Quantum uh, Magazine, where uh, this ubiquity of tc uh, distribution have been uh, discussed and uh, one can go and read them. They're very nice. Okay. So, uh, so apart from this, the tc distribution also has some another universal feature, which is the following. That uh, remember that we have started with this distribution where uh, it was uh, quadratic. That means we had these charges which are interacting via this logarithmic interaction and they're confined in a an, uh, harmonic, global harmonic interaction. It turns out that if we replace this harmonic, in, uh, uh, harmonic potential, global external potential, by some arbitrary sufficiently uh, bounded potential, then um, also. Uh, if this is sufficiently bounded and uh, then uh, the charges will again settle down over a finite region and, and as a result the lambda max will have some average value and it will fluctuate around this and as long as the density here uh, vanishes as square root of, um, from the uh, square root of the distance from this point then the typical fluctuation of lambda max will again be of n to the power minus two third and in that case, the typical fluctuations will be described by Tessuidum distribution. So this is another f universal feature of the Tessuidum distribution. Now the question that we uh, ask is that instead of changing the, uh, the uh, uh, external bound bounding potential, if we change the interactions among the particles, then we look at, if we look at the uh, lambda max, the statistics of the lambda max, will the typical fluctuations, typical um, fluctuations of lambda max be again given by a uh, tessuidum distribution or not? So the question is what should we choose for the interaction? And a natural choice is to choose the actual 1D Coulomb gas. So remember that although the, uh, here the charges are living in one dimension, but uh, we had considered a 2D Coulombic interaction. But instead of that, if we consider the actual 1D uh, Coulomb interaction, which is uh, linear, if we, we can choose that, if we choose that, then the answer, short answer to this question is that it, uh, the uh, distribution of the X max, the typical fluctuation, will not be described by the Tessuidum distribution. Okay, so uh, let me briefly uh, uh, tell you the results first, and then I'll uh, give you some uh, idea about how to derive those results. So. Uh, uh, we uh, look at this um, uh, system that we have uh, charged particles in charged particles which, which are confined in a global harmonic potential and they are interacting via this 1D linear repulsive Coulomb interaction. And, uh, and we want to look at the um, um, fluctuation of the position of the rightmost particle uh, of this system. So this system, interestingly, this, this 
uh, if we consider that this is a Boltzmann wave, then this is the energy. And this energy, this is an Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian also appears as a description of 1D, one component uh, plasma. I, I forgot to write something here. So it also describes the 1D, one component uh, plasma. Uh, actually, the, that Hamiltonian uh, gives you the uh, uh, equation of state which is close to the actual 1D, one component plasma uh, um, problem. And that was uh, actually studied by Baxter, RJ Baxter, and he showed that. Uh, Okay, so, so in that sense, this problem is also has some importance uh, in studying. Okay, so uh, uh, because of this harmonic potential, once again, this potential will pull, will try to bring all the charges to the center of this potential, whereas this one will try to push them. As a result, the charges will again uh, try to settle down over a finite region. And in the larger limit, we, uh, we find that the charges will uh, uh, indeed settle down over a finite region uh, on an average. And, uh, average density, we find that it is uniform. In contrast to the log gas, where the average density was described by the um, uh, semicircular law. And obviously the lambda x max, which is the position of the rightmost particle, will be uh, on an average, average will be 2, 2 alpha, because it will sit at the edge of this uh, charge distribution. And it turns out that the fluctuation, typical fluctuation of x max around this mean value is of order 1 over n, in contrast to the log gas case where the lambda max around this mean value is of order n power minus 2 third. And uh, uh, most interestingly, the typical fluctuations uh, of this fluctuation, the distribution of these typical fluctuations are described by a limiting distribution in the infinite infinite limit, which is not given by the tessitum distribution, which is obtained from the solution of a, a nonlinear eigenvalue equation. And, uh, whereas in the log gas case, these typical uh, fluctuations are described by the tessitum distribution, which is obtained from the solutions of uh, Pan-Levy two equation. Here we get an analogous uh, but uh, different and a non-local eigenvalue equation. And of course, this distribution describes the typical fluctuations. So we also look at the large deviations, and we find large deviation, uh, appropriate large deviation functions, which are describing the uh, probabilities of the fluctuations of order one on this side and also on this side. And we compute these functions. And again, by looking at these expressions, we find that this, although these uh, typical fluctuations are not described by tessuidum distribution, but these uh, large deviation functions still give a, a third order phase transition if we appropriately define the free energy density. Okay, so these are the results. So let me now briefly uh, give, uh, um, tell how to derive these results. So once again, we start with the, um, this um, uh, Boltzmann weight, where here I wrote the energy explicitly. So this is the char um, um, N charges, which are confined in harmonic potential and interacting via this 1D Coulomb interaction. And uh, in the large N limit, we suppose we want to look at the typical density of the average density. So in order to do that, what do we do? The typical or average density can be obtained by minimizing this energy. And if we do that, then we find that the minimum energy configuration is given by this, that the charges sit at equal distances, and there is a, a maximum dis distance, a maximum point here on the positive side, and also a maximum point on the negative side, uh, which you can get it from in the, if you take in going to infinite limit. And since the charges sit at equal distances, this immediately says that the charge density uh, in the in going to infinite limit will be uniform over a finite uh, uh, range. So we have this uh, uniform uh, uh, distribution in your charge density. So average x, x max is 2 alpha, which is at the edge of this uh, uniform charge density. Now, in order to get, a, uh, get an idea about the fluctuation, that this x max will fluctuate around this value. So in order to get an uh, idea, we look at the typical interparticle distance at the edge. And to get that, what do we do? We basically integrate this uh, distribution over that typical scale so that it has one over n because this charge density is uh, uh, normalized to unity so it, this thing has to be will be of order one over n so so this gives you a scale of uh, the typical fluctuations uh, uh, interestingly since the charge distribution density is uniform then this interparticle uh, um, distance uh, even in the bulk is also order one over n okay so now we have uh, the average and the typical fluctuation uh, 
So then, in analogy with the uh, random matrix problem, we can expect that uh, this quantity, after uh, shifting by this mean value and scaled by this typical fluctuation, should uh, be given by a limiting distribution in the large n limit. Which means that if we define this variable z by this expression, then in the large n limit, z should have a distribution which is n independent. So that's what we expect in analogy with the random matrix theory. Let's see what we get. So to compute the um, the probability of the uh, the x max, so the, the usual procedure is that you start with uh, the cumulative probability. You ask what the probability that x max is less than or equal to w, which means that all the particles are at um, position are less than or equal to w. So this you can compute it from this distribution, which is basically the ratio of these two partition function. Well, and the denominator you have this uh, partition function of the unrestricted gas, where on the numerator, you have the partition function, which, uh, which is restricted by putting an infinite wall at position W, because you are not allowing the charges to go beyond W. So that's why you put an extra infinite wall at uh, x equal to W. Now, if you have this function, then by taking the derivative, you can get the probability distribution. So the main task is to compute this partition function with this infinite wall at W at uh, x equal to w. So to compute that, we look at that the, we observe that the, this energy, expression of this energy is uh, symmetric under permutation of these variables x i. So as a result, this multi-particle integral, which is n-dimensional, can be uh, written as n factorial times this multi-particle integral, where these integrals are done with uh, this constraint that x1 is less than x2 less than x3 the position of the first particle is less than the position of the second particle and and all the particles are below w so you do this integral with this constraint now because of this constraint this uh, uh, absolute value is not there anymore and as a result now one can simplify this and write as yeah, sum of quadratic terms plus some constant, which is imp uh, not important because in the end we are taking the ratio. So it's a sum of quadratic terms. So which naturally says that one should uh, do this following transformation. And if we do this following transformation, that each of them are independent variables like this, then this um, uh, uh, um, transformation says that this constraint now becomes this, epsilon k, k minus 1 is less than or equal to epsilon k plus 4 alpha. And if after doing this transformation, this partition function is expressed as n factorial times this constant times a function of this variable. And you see that because of this transformation, we naturally get the right combination of the scaling variable, which we initially expected. And this function is the partition function of another gas, where the particles are confined again in harmonic potential, but they are now interacting by short range interaction. So interestingly, we started with computing the partition function of a long range interacting gas. And by some transformation, we uh, ended up computing the partition function of a short range interacting gas, which is nice because usually these functions behave uh, 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 well. And if you look at carefully, then this is the partition. If you put alpha equal to zero, then this is the partition fun exactly the partition function of hard point gas. So they are confined in harmonic potential, but they are not allowed to cross each other. Now, if you increase alpha from zero a little bit, then basically you are softening this hard co uh, hardcore condition. And uh, uh, as a result, the particle on the left, one particle on the left, can cross the particle on the right side, but by an amount of, at most by four alpha. So that is the softening uh, of this hardcore interaction. So this is a, a partition function of a short range interacting gas or n particles which are confined in harmonic potential. So, okay, very good. So then if we know this, then uh, this quantity is basically again the ratio and we write down this ratio as a function f of f alpha xn. Until now, this function is still depends on n explicitly uh, because of there are n integrals and uh, where x is the, the right uh, scaling variable. Okay, so 
but we are interested in the situation that uh, uh, that the, this function in the n going to infinity whether this function in the n going to infinity bit converges to an n independent scaling function or not so in order to check that we first uh, look uh, uh, need to look at what is the equation that this function satisfies so in order to get that what do we do we take the derivative of this function which is the multi particle integral and then divided by uh, the d alpha infinity n and we see that this function satisfies this non-local um, differential recursive uh, uh, equation so in order uh, in order to get an in independent scaling distribution what do we need that one need, oh, we need to show that this function in the n going to infinite limit converges to an n independent function however there is a, a constant independent constant so it, oh, it means that this is possible if this independent constant goes to an, uh, an independent constant in the n going to infinite limit. This ratio goes to uh, some constant which is independent of n. So let's see whether it does so or not. Uh, so once again we start from this. Now this uh, x is equal to infinity so it's basically an um, unrestricted um, um, uh, partisan function of the un unrestricted gas which are shortage interacting and confined in uh, harmonic potential and since they are a shortage interaction then the if we look at the f free energy of uh, associated to this this gas that should be additive with a number of particles because these are shortage sort of interaction that we can expect so we can uh, uh, then we can call that this quantity as the free energy per particle and if it happens so then immediately this ratio in the n going to infinite limit should converge to uh, uh, um, converge to the exponential of the free energy per particle which is uh, constant which does not depend on n okay so this ratio actually goes to a, uh, an independent constant uh, which is very good so this this ratio goes to a alpha now if we say that this function also in the n going to infinite limit goes to a function which is n independent then this function satisfies this equation which has to satisfy these conditions. So one has to solve this equation with these conditions. So remember that f alpha was the scaling uh, 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 function associated with the cumulative distribution. So this also has the property of the cumulative distribution, cumulative function. Um, and uh, so this function should go to one if x goes to infinity. And similarly, this function has to go to minus uh, zero if x goes to minus infinity. And since this is a cumulative probability, it has to be non-negative throughout, so from minus infinity to plus infinity. And the derivative, which is a distribution probability density, uh, it also has to be non-negative from uh, x minus infinity to plus infinity. Now, if this equation has some sensible solution with this uh, conditions, then you can say that this quantity actually in the n going to infinite limit uh, converges to the scaling uh, distribution or uh, scaling function. And in turn, we can say that the distribution converges to the scaling distribution, which is obtained from the derivative of this uh, 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 this um, function f alpha, capital F alpha x. So let's see. Um, so basically, what do we have to do? We have to solve this non local. Uh, equation. Now in this equation we don't know what is a alpha and also we don't know what is f alpha, f alpha x. So this is like a non-local eigenvalue equation where uh, a alpha is the ratio <coughs> of these two quantities. So competing, so one has to solve this equation by uh, simultaneously for a alpha and f, a, f alpha of x, both. Computing a alpha uh, for uh, all alpha is usually hard. Uh, um, uh, I mean, computing it analytically is usually hard. So what one does, um, one can compute it uh, numerically, and also one can look at asymptotic uh, properties of this uh, um, uh, function. So here uh, I would like to mention that R.J. Baxter, as I said earlier, he also looked at uh, the similar um, uh, problem of, uh, of interacting particles, and he was computing again partition function in a, in a, in a finite box. And he also uh, encountered a similar con uh, constant, and he analyzed uh, the value of, or the asymptotics of this constant in the alpha going to zero and alpha going to infinity limit. And we use his results and translate it up accordingly in, uh, into our problem. And we find that A alpha has this following asymptotic, which diverges as one over alpha for alpha going to zero, and it uh, goes to a constant in the alpha going to infinity, which is one over root two pi. 
So with this information, what we do, we uh, numerically solve this equation for other values of alpha and see whether it uh, um, uh, matches with the other asymptotic limit or not. And here I uh, give a comparison. So the, the, the points are obtained from uh, uh, solving this equation uh, uh, numerically. Uh, and uh, the lines are asymptotic, these asymptotics, and we see that they are uh, matching quite well. So by sol while solving this thing, we also get f alpha of x. So f alpha, x, f, f alpha of x is the cumulative probability. So by taking the derivative, we get the distribution, and which we can compare with the direct Monte Carlo simulations of the uh, original uh, um, energy. And here the points are from simulations for different alpha, and the lines, con the dashed lines, are from numerical solution of, of this equation. So here also we see that it, uh, uh, this, they are agreeing quite well. And one another thing to observe is that at the the tails of these distributions are quite asymmetric, which you can compute, which we look at, and we find that this uh, dis uh, distribution has these as asymmetric tails, which again uh, decays on the uh, left side. That is, that x going to minus infinity as exponential of minus mod x cubed by 24 alpha, whereas on the right side uh, it decays as e to the power minus x, x square by 2. So remember that in the tessitum distribution also, on the left side the tessitum distribution was decaying as e to the power minus uh, mod z cube times some constant. Here also it's uh, mod x cube, it decays as mod x cube, which is um, some similarity. Okay, so. Uh, so this distribution uh, describes only the typical fluctuations. So then we look at the large deviation from large deviations also, the large deviations of order one on both sides. So let us look at the uh, first look at the left large deviation. So so the typically uh, the x max will be fluctuating around this average value. Now you want to observe the find out the probability that the x max is at this place, which is order one distance away on the left side from this point. And once again, to compute probabilities of such events, we again look at this um, cumulative probability, which is the ratio of this partition function. And again, we have to find out this partition function. Now the wall is, the infinite wall is at order one distance away on the left side from the um, mean position. So uh, remember that if we put a wall, uh, which is above uh, 2 alpha, then in the n going to infinite limit, the presence of this wall does not affect the distribution of these charges. Because uh, they, are happily, they are happy to sit here within this minus 2 alpha to plus alpha. Now if we bring this wall inside and bring it uh, order one distance uh, um, inside in the left side from 2 alpha, and because of that, the, this wall will push all the charges here, as a result, all the charges will rearrange and the equilibrium density will no longer be this uniform density from minus 2 alpha to 2 alpha. But it turns out that this presence of this wall does not affect the uh, density here between minus 2 alpha to uh, um, W. What happens is that all the charges between 2 alpha to W gets accumulated at the, presence of, uh, at the position of the wall. And that gives you the new central point density, where C is computed from the charges uh, uh, total number of charges here. So we, we, with this uh, saddle point density, we use that saddle point density in computation of this partition function, and we compute that partition function, and we find that this uh, cumulative probability is given by this large division form, where we have it to minus nq phi minus w, or phi minus is explicitly given by this expression. And once again, you note that this phi minus goes to zero as we approach uh, w, as w approaches to 2 alpha from below, as 2 alpha minus w power cube. Okay, so one can understand this factor n cube in this large deviation form as follows. So uh, it is intuitive that this probability, cumulative probability, will be proportional to the exponential of minus of the delta e which is the amount of energy involved in pushing all the charges from here to this, all the charges inside this. And what is the typical order of this uh, energy, delta E? So you remember that this is the expression of the energy, and since x is of order are of order 1, then this energy is of order n cube. Now you are, you are pushing a fraction of charges by order 1 distance, 
then these quantities would also be of order uh, n cube. And that's why we get this e to the power minus n cube times a modulated function, which is the rate function, and we get these explicit expressions of this mirate function. Now, let us look at the right side. And uh, on the right side, uh, what do we want? We want to find out the probability that the, the x max is at w, which is order one distance away on the right side from this mean position. And to compute the probability of such event, it's, it's uh, convenient to look at this probability that x max is greater than or equal to w, and which is 1 minus the usual cumulative probability. And again, it can be written as a ratio of two functions. And in the numerator, this function uh, can be again uh, rewritten with the proper changes of the uh, limits. And it turns out that the configuration that contributes most to this integral is the, uh, is the following con uh, configuration, where you pull one charge from this uh, sea of charges and place it at order one distance, uh, that is at, at w, at order one distance, and the rest of the charges are sitting here. And the energy cost for doing so can be computed, and it has two, comp two parts. One is from the uh, global uh, harmonic potential, and another is from the interaction of this charge with the rest of the charges. And if we compute that charge, then this uh, quantity is proportional to exponential of that energy, and that energy one can compute it, uh, it'll be n squared times a modulating function. And that, that is the rate function, actual rate function, which we compute and it gives, it goes to zero as w approaches to 2 alpha from above, as w minus 2 alpha square. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, kind of uh, summary of the results. The typical fluctuations around this mean value uh, uh, are of order 1 over n, and which are described by a limiting distribution in the line going to infinite limit, and that limiting function can be obtained from uh, the solution of this non-local um, um, eigenvalue equation. And then there are um, um, large deviations of order 1 on both sides of this mean uh, position. And those large deviations are uh, described by these appropriate um, large deviation functions, which are phi minus and phi plus. And once again, note that the speed here is n cube on the left side, and here it's n square on the right side. And those are associated with the energy uh, involved in creating those events. And here, if we cons construct this uh, free energy density, that is, we take the log of this cumulative probability and then divide it by n cube and take the negative side, uh, negative of that, and then take n going to infinity limit, then this function converges to this of um, um, an independent form, and which again has a discontinuity in the third order derivative. So we suggest that the there is again a third order phase transition, although the two phases are connected by a different function, not by the tc -Edom distribution. So this is a, a summary in comparison with the um, Dyson's log gas or the random matrix um, uh, eigenvalue distributions and the Coulomb gas. So thank you. Anupam, when you change the interaction, do you have do you still have a matrix representation of the No, no. So you're just really changing the interaction from the log to the Yes, yes. So yeah, actually uh, the matrix representation I think uh, happens only if you have Vandermont determinant the log interactions. But for this we don't know if we uh, yeah, this doesn't have any matrix representation. The Monte Carlo simulation, you just generate the again. Yeah, we this is the this is the Hamiltonian yeah. and then we uh, take the how do you generate the Monte Carlo mm -hmm. simulation? Like, how do you generate, how do you generate the, the configurations of the eigenvalues? So, like, with, yeah, you generate the, with the energy function? Or? Yeah, you generate the new configuration and accept it with the zero minus beta delta E. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so uh, the third order phase transition, uh, how generic is it? Because I guess even if you have a different potential, uh, your saddle points on the two sides will be different. One will be pulling one charge away and one will be pushing lots of charges. Yes. So, because the two saddle points are different, so for any, you know, non-trivial potential between the charges, you should get a third order, I mean, a phase transition between... No, not maybe not third order, because it depends on how this function uh, goes to zero. It, deco it goes to zero as cubic power, that's why you get a third order phase transition. So what is the reason why it goes to zero as cubic power? Uh, oh, that way, why it goes to zero as cubic power, that I don't know. We compute it and we find it uh, as cubic. Is the physical reason? But 
Satya, do you have any physical? Why does it go as cubic power? Why does it go to zero as cubic power? Yeah. So I, I have a couple of elementary questions and maybe I, uh, things you mentioned I, I, I missed. So in, in, the final, in the final summary, you had the, you know, the Coulomb, you know, these, these two. So, and you also mentioned something about, oh, if, if, if the confining potential has a funny shape, but it's still confining, um, you know, the, the statistics is the same. So what happens if the potential is, confining potential is very asymmetric? If you have a hard wall on the left, say, and I'm interested on the distribution on the right-hand side. If you have a hard wall on the left and this side is... Yeah, yeah. hard wall, half, half, you know... Half and this side is uh, smooth. Yeah. Probably... Right <laughs> yeah, probably, as long as... So then again, the dis charge dis distensity will not be this, obviously. It will be something like this. Something. Now, as long as this density goes to zero here as square root, yeah, then again, it will be tissuidum, I think. I had some, uh, so the other totally silly question is that here you have this long range interaction in 1D, and this gives rise to these phase transitions, as you're saying, depending on the nature of the interaction, the transition can be different, this is what you're proving. Yeah, yeah. And I guess it's obvious that if you don't have long range interactions in this problem, there's no, there's no singularity. So if I had a cutoff in my interactions. Yes. Smooth cutoff so that they decay in a certain way, or a hard cutoff in interactions. That, that's if you do not have, if you do not have a certain interaction, I don't think you'll get this uh, density. They will all collapse probably, or maybe they will try to be around this regime. So I'm saying is if so there. No, yeah. I know, but what I'm asking is about the statistics, because if I confine something with short range interactions, suppose I have something that's repulsive. Yeah. That's the distribution of the... Of, of Independent the, variables. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Thanks. <laughs>